Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Victor from the Star Events team, and I'm glad to be your host for the session tonight. In conjunction with World Heart Day, we aim to educate and aid everyone on the topic of diabetes-related heart disease with the help of our experts. Our main topic will cover the various diabetes-related complications, particularly in relation to the heart and kidneys, as well as provide tips for caregivers and at the same time, highlight the urgency of early detection. Thank you for everyone uh, for joining this online seminar on Oh My Sweetheart. This one hour session is organized by Star Media Group and a big thanks to Boringer Ingelheim for supporting and making this webinar possible. It is definitely an honor to have them with us. For tonight's session, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Lee Zin Win, consultant intervention cardiologist at the University Malaya Medical Center and University Malaya Specialist Center. Dr. Shalini C. Shiri Daran, consultant physician and endocologist from Pantai Hospital, Kuala Lumpur. And Dr. Yu Xiongxiong, consultant nepidologist and physician from Makota Medical Center, Malacca. And the session will be moderated by Douglas Lim. This session is also streamed live on Starbiz Facebook page. So thank you everyone who's tuning in right now. Do share our Starbiz Facebook Live with any of your colleagues, friends or family who are keen to join. All right, a few quick housekeeping matters before we begin. As everyone dials in to this webinar through different internet bandwidth and devices, you may or may not experience minor technical glitches. So please be patient if there's any. To minimize the risk of technical glitch, all participants are muted and video cam turned off by default. But do participate by posting questions to our speakers. You may send your questions to our speakers at any time during the session. On your user panel, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and post your questions there if you're using Zoom. Uh, we will actually pick up the questions from the Q&A button, so remember to post them there and not in the chat button. For those who are actually joining us on Facebook, you can place your questions in the comment section. However, should you wish to have the panelists answer um, you directly after the, uh, you know, directly, please do register on Zoom. The bit.ly link is bit.ly slash for your sweetheart. We have actually placed it in the comment section on the Facebook uh, as well. There will be a short survey at the end. So to those joining us on Zoom, please take a few minutes to complete it as your opinion matters to us. Lastly, and most importantly, please engage, learn and enjoy. Before we start the session, there's a video which we'd like to share with you. Let's enjoy the video together. It's your girl Uni again. A big welcome to all my fans. And remember, for this chat, you can ask me anything or Uni thing. <laughs> okay, so the first and foremost question: uh, Nama penuh Uni apa? Well, nama penuh I Uni kenapa? But panggilan manja is Uni manis lah. All right, stop it. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, next from Mr. Ham Saplo. Eh, Ham. Tak boleh cakap. Ham, my God. <laughs> Unless it's turkey ham. Delish. Okay, uh, boleh you need belanja a sweet smile? Anything for you, Mr. Ham. You like it? <laughs> ow, ow, I can get some more because it's just too sweet. Mampus kau. Next, uh, Mr. Muru Gatal has a request. Nyanyilah satu lagu manis. Of course, Mr. Muru Gatal. This is just specially for you. Whoops! <laughs> Telanga! Oh. Okay. Um. <laughs> Mr. Muru Gatal. <laughs> Uh, here's a sweet song for you. Gula gula sugar saccharine. Gula gula sugar saccharine. Uh, gula gula sugar saccharine. Honey, honey, honey. Taboo. Okay. 
Hey sweetheart, stop it. Alright? You are so sweet and lovely, tapi mesti ada something yang tak manis kan? Hmm, it's a good question. Oh, I mean, muka I manis, personality I manis, uh, suara I manis. Oh yes, ada something that I tak kencing manis. Alright, because I check my blood sugar level frequently. Okay, um, check blood sugar level tak mahal ke? Hey everyone, listen. Alright, practice active listening. I check up frequently. The keyword is free. Mana ada mahal. In fact, I think we should all get it. Hello, Douglas Lim here. Hope you've all recovered from the intoxicating sweetness that is uni because I'm actually here with an important message. Malaysia, we have the highest rate of diabetes in Asia at 17.5%. That means there are over 3.5 million Malaysians living with this condition. People with diabetes are four times more likely to develop heart diseases. Four times more likely. And 50% of all heart disease deaths are from people with diabetes. That's why it is so important for all of us to get screened regularly. And it doesn't have to cost you any money. Seriously. In fact, you can redeem a free diabetes screening voucher right now. Just scan the QR code or log on to www.foryoursweetheart.my and head out to the participating outlets. Do it. Like seriously. Hope you liked the video. Now let us go and meet Uni, also known as Douglas. Over to you, Douglas. Hello. Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this live session. Before I start, can everybody hear me loud and clear? If you can, can you smash the one button on your keyboard? Can you just uh, smash the number one? All right, thank you. Thank you, Louisa. See you there. Thank you, Carmen. Hi, Ken Ng. Hi. Hi, lovely, lovely. Okay. This uh, session will only work if it's interactive, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, you have to be uh, as interactive as possible. We are here to answer some very important questions, some burning questions. Um, I, first of all, would like to uh, say, oh, oh are, the, are the doctors all in ready? Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Yu, Dr. Shalini, they're all here to answer your questions. This, I'm, I'm so impressed with the opening page, the, the holding slide, it had their names, their pictures and all of their qualifications. And on my picture, it says uh, Douglas Lim, uh, what is it? Moderator only. Like I've, I have no other qualifications. <laughs> like, <laughs> just, just to let everyone know here, guys, Douglas Lim is moderator only. Do not take any advice. So this is uh, the For Your Sweetheart campaign. Okay, um, it's a nationwide public awareness and educational uh, campaign organized by the Malaysian Endocrine and Metabolic Society, MEMS, and the Malaysian Diabetes, uh, Diabetes Educator Society, MDES, supported by uh, Beringer Ingelheim. The campaign aims to educate the public, especially those living with diabetes, uh, also about the link between diabetes and heart diseases and the importance of early detection. I know two uh, people personally uh, who have diabetes they're living with it and I can see how intrusive it can be to their lives to their lives to the lives of their families to the lives of their caregivers and so I am like all for the importance of early detection so what you can do if you're watching this right now you actually can redeem a free diabetes screening at any participating clinic nationwide this is ongoing until December 2021 please visit now uh, visit www.foryoursweetheart.my for those of you who are the organizers can you if you can you can just put up this um, this uh, address on the um, on the chat here is www.foryoursweetheart.my to get your free diabetes screening voucher this webinar is also live on the star online fb page and the star biz fb page do share it with your friends and family so okay we are also pleased to present you this live webinar in conjunction with World Heart Day, which falls on not today. I'm not sure. 
<laughs> day which falls on the 29th of September. For once, Malaysia, we are early. <laughs> Usually, we'll be late. <laughs> we'll be like, hey, when was it that way? Two weeks ago. Sorry, eh? belated. So, no, we are early this time. Okay, World Heart Day falls on the 29th of September. We are tying in with this. So, today's one is, oh, my sweetheart. Who is the culprit? Is it the heart, the kidney, or the pancreas? Do I know the answer? Absolutely not. Okay, so we have three speakers who do. Can I please now formal, form, formally welcome? We have Dr. Lee, is a consultant, interventional cardiologist, University Malaya Medical Center. He obtained his medical degree from University Putra, Malaysia, followed by his postgraduate degree. He also has got uh, this uh, membership at the Royal Colleges of Physicians of the United Kingdom from the Royal College of Physicians. We also have Dr. Shalini, consultant, physician, and endocrinologist. I'm just hoping I said that right, man. Endocrine, Pantai Hospital, Kuala Lumpur. Obtained a medical degree from University of Science Malaysia. Uh, Honoured with best student. Best student, oh. Just overachiever. Man. In uh, psychiatry and was conferred with endocrinology and diabetes fellowship. We also have Dr. Yu Xiangxiang, consultant, nephrologist, and physician. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Yu. I, I love how I'm saying so many things uh, that I have very little knowledge about. Just saying them with confidence. Uh, his uh, special interest in renal transplant, nephrology interventions, and hemodialysis care. <laughs> More words that go over my head. So anyway, guys, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, before we get on to your questions, so those who are at home, uh, let's just set the stage a bit. We're going to have a little discussion here. And to kick things off, Dr. Shalini, this one is for you. Huh? Uh, could you please explain? This is just to set the stage, very basic, so that everyone is on the same page here. Please explain what is diabetes-related complications and what are the top five complications faced by diabetes patients? You could also please share some insight into these complications, especially in Malaysia. Dr. Shalini, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you, Douglas. And I would probably just use these slides to just broadly uh, categorize the complications of diabetes to, into two broad categories, mainly microvascular complications and macrovascular complications. So what are these meaning of this microvascular? Micro being small, vascular means vessels. So disease of the small vessels are usually early on in the, in the you know, so type 2 diabetes is a, uh, progressive disease. It's a disease of, with a continuum. And early on in the diagnosis, usually the, the disease that are usually manifested are the microvascular, small vessel disease that supplies vital organs like the eyes, the kidneys, and the nerves. So if it involves uh, the eyes, we usually call it retinopathy, disease of the blood vessels to the retina, besides causing also increased incidence of glaucoma and also cataract. Okay. And also, uh, uh, kidney uh, blood supplies to the kidneys are also compromised. So what do we have is usually presented with some evidence of leakage of protein in the urine and later on to a full-blown nephropathy or kidney failure. Um, not to forget, uh, blood vessels to the nerves are also compromised. It causes neuropathy, damage to the nerves, causes symptoms of numbness or pain, tingling sensation or burning pain, or we call it neuropathic pain. These are the microvascular complications. How about macrovascular complications? These are disease of macro meaning big, vascular means vessels, disease of the big or large vessels to the brain causes stroke, to the heart causes ischemic heart disease and often people forget including us doctors to look at the feet and also to ask for symptoms of claudication pain or uh, is, which usually um, presents due to the compromised blood flow to the lower limbs and, and if not it will also cause increases incidence of diabetic foot ulcers and may, which may result in amputation all right next mm -hmm. So coming back to uh, the heart, cardiovascular disease and diabetes, just uh, we have a cardiologist who will probably tell you more, but let me uh, set the stage by telling you type two diabetes is one of the main, if not the second main contributor of the incidence of all the heart attacks that are admitted uh, to the hospital. 
All right, so it's the first will be hypertension, second uh, risk factor will be diabetes. And besides uh, causing uh, ischemic heart disease or heart attacks, it also causes heart failure, all right? About two-third uh, greater risk uh, among people living with diabetes to develop heart failure compared to someone without the disease, okay? And many of the patients with diabetes eventually die uh, because of cardiovascular complication, be it stroke or a heart attack. All right, so uh, next, if you look at this uh, graph here, what is essentially telling us is the, the what diseases are usually prevalent uh, according to the duration of diabetes. Before I go into the duration of diabetes, I probably would like to explain a little bit that many of the time patients would not know that they have diabetes because it is indeed a silent disease. The symptoms of diabetes, which is increased uh, urination, increased thirst, uh, weight loss, lethargy, usually comes when the blood glucose level are indeed very high. So when the, the diagnosis of diabetes may have been uh, there unnoticed or unrecognized for many years. So if you are early on, or if you're doing your screening regularly, maybe you do it every year, probably you pick up the, the the point of time when you're actually diagnosed and then you can say yes this is a point of time the exact point of time where my diabetes set in and from then on it has been five years so if you can look at the graph uh, the microvascular complication be retinopathy neuropathy and um, nephropathy uh, here is depicted by leakage of protein called microalbuminuria usually comes early on and major uh, or the, the macrovascular complications usually occur after probably around uh, five to 10 years after diagnosis. So the sad part about this disease is that we have patients coming in, uh, first presentation of the diabetes is actually heart attack and stroke, all right? So that is how long you can go undiagnosed with the disease and presenting only with the end complications of diabetes be it heart attack or stroke, or worse with the amputation of the, your limb, right? All right, so I think uh, that's all. And before I forget, next slide, please. If we have a next slide, no, okay. All right, so uh, for the sake of, uh, for the interest that we are all very COVID-centric and COVID-focused at the moment, I would like to tell you the importance of diabetes in relation to COVID. As you can see here, mortality, mortality means death, causes of death among COVID patients, uh, I mean, risk factor that contributes to death among our COVID patients, diabetes is the highest, all right? Okay, there are other reasons why patients may die because of the disease. Uh, don't forget being obese or overweight puts you at higher risk of dying or ending up in the ICU if you contracted the, the virus. All right, thank you. That's all for now. Thank you very much, Dr. Shalini. I, I, those numbers are, are very staggering. Eh? <laughs> I don't know. Yes. I, uh, I don't know what to say, actually. Um, usually, I can come up with a joke, but uh, I didn't see anything funny. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry to those who are expecting me to joke about that. I saw those numbers and uh, I, I, I got nothing to say. So can I please uh, have Dr. Lee now? I, I hope your news is not, is not as tragic. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Lee, how does diabetes affect the heart and what are the symptoms to look out for? Also, please share some insights into heart-related complications arising from diabetes amongst Malaysians. Dr. Lee? Well, thank you very much, uh, Douglas, for those very relevant questions. Unfortunately, my news is quite the same. Um, I wish to start off by saying that diabetes and heart disease often go hand in hand. You would have heard earlier that a person with diabetes has a two to fourfold higher risk of developing heart disease. And the two most common forms of um, heart disease in patients with diabetes are coronary artery disease and heart failure. And ischemic heart disease remains the number one cause of death in Malaysia. In coronary artery disease, there is a buildup of cholesterol in the blood vessels that supply oxygen and nutrition to the heart muscles. And this eventually would lead to hardening of the arteries, a process commonly known as atherosclerosis. 
diabetes increases the risk and accelerates the development of atherosclerosis. And when the cholesterol plug would break apart, the body then tries to seal the breakage by sending platelets to seal it up. And this is unfortunately not good as this would then lead to the formation of a blood clot for which the flow of blood would be blocked, oxygen delivery would be impaired, and the patient would end up having a heart attack. If a person is above the age of 60 and has diabetes, the risk of developing a heart attack is in fact similar to a person who has had a previous heart attack but does not have diabetes. Coronary artery disease accounts for two thirds of deaths associated with diabetes. And in fact, if the same process happens in arteries to the brain, this will lead to a stroke. And if it happens in the arteries to the legs, this will lead to peripheral arterial disease. All these conditions are often included under the common term of cardiovascular disease, which simply means a group of disorders of heart and blood vessels. The World Heart Organization reported that in 2019, an estimated 17.9 million people died from cardiovascular disease, representing 32% of all deaths globally. And amongst these, 85% were due to heart attack and stroke. With regard to coronary artery disease, the common symptoms are chest pain or discomfort, typically heavy in nature and towards the left side of the heart or rather the left side of the chest, pain in the shoulders, jaw, and left arm, shortness of breath, dizziness, nausea, and excessive sweating. It's also worthwhile mentioning that not all symptoms would be present at the same time, and patients with diabetes are often known to have minimal symptoms despite the presence of severe coronary artery disease. And data from our National Cardiovascular Disease Database have reported that approximately 50% of patients that were admitted for heart attacks had diabetes. And on the coronary angiogram, patients with diabetes were also noted to have more severe disease, oftentimes involving multiple arteries. Heart failure, on the other hand, happens when the heart loses its ability to pump enough blood to the rest of the body. And diabetes can lead to heart failure either directly or through the process of worsening of coronary artery disease. The symptoms of heart failure include shortness of breath, fatigue, and swollen legs, which starts usually from the feet and extends upwards towards the ankles, shins, knees, and thighs. And a patient may also have wheeze if there is a large amount of fluid accumulation within the lungs. The statistics from the Malaysian National Heart Failure Registry indicates that 59% of patients that were admitted for heart failure had diabetes. I think the bigger problem is the fact that people with diabetes are also more likely to have other conditions that raise the risk for heart disease. And this include high blood pressure and high levels of blood cholesterol. What is most worrying in my opinion is that the increment in risk of developing cardiovascular disease starts at the stage of pre-diabetes. And it was estimated that in 2019, there were close to 5 million individuals in Malaysia living with probable pre-diabetes. Thank you, Douglas. You end with that bombshell, Dr. Lee. Five... We have what? What are we? We are 26 million, 27 million. In total, 5 million. A huge number, Douglas. And in, um, the process starts even at that stage. And that would okay. I, I actually have some questions of my own, but I'm sure everybody else also has has questions here. But before that, uh, can we also uh, get uh, Dr. Dr. Yu to come in? Uh, Dr. Yu, your first two questions are, how does diabetes affect the, just now the heart, now kidneys? Are you just no end? How does diabetes affect the kidneys? And what are the symptoms to look out for? Could you please also share some insights into kidney-related complications arising from diabetes amongst Malaysians? Thank you, Douglas. And keeping true to our theme, who is the major culprit for diabetic patients suffering? I'm going to give you my answer and I'm going to prove to you, to the judge and the jury, the biggest culprit is the kidney. 
not the heart, not the pancreas. How? So first of all, to answer your question, how does diabetes affect the kidney? It can affect the kidney directly or indirectly. Directly will be poor sugar control. Having sugar levels always higher than the nature intended us to, to have, you will damage the blood vessels. The piping that brings blood to our body, with all this high sugar, it causes oxidative stress. It causes uh, damage to the vessels. And what other organ other than the kidney with the most number of blood vessels? Kidneys being the filter, all the blood will go in there every day, continuously, every minute to be filtered. And those rich blood vessels will be damaged very fast. You get filter problems, you get leakage of protein into the urine. So those are the direct causes of kidney damage due to diabetes. Indirect causes includes all the things that come together with diabetes. Diabetics, uh, diabetic patients can have high blood pressure, can have high cholesterol levels, can have high uric acid levels. All this metabolic insult will further damage the kidney through different pathways, but all road leads to Rome. All will cause kidney damage, directly or indirectly. And the symptoms is a spectrum. It can start from very mild, asymptomatic symptoms where the patient feels well. Unless they do a blood test or a urine test, they probably don't know that the kidney is already being damaged. And many times, symptoms only occur when up to 90% of the kidney is damaged. So it's like a silent killer, a silent assassin. So when the symptoms start to occur, you may start with maybe early stage frothy urine. Frothy urine means bubble in the urine. Those are the early signs. You will further progress into pedal edema, legs being swollen, breathlessness, reduced energy, reduced effort tolerance, poor appetite, sleep disturbances. And as it progresses, you might go to symptoms with nausea, vomiting, even fits, you know, seizures, or coma. Of course, that will be the end spectrum. So how does diabetes cause kidney disease and what will, will be the end ultimate problem? The end ultimate problem, we call it end-stage renal disease. End-stage meaning the patient cannot survive unless some kind of long-term renal replacement therapy is started, such as dialysis, something that you see frequently. Uh, it's like, you know, it's so common nowadays, which is a shameful thing to admit. But for Malaysia, we are currently the world's top five in terms of incident of diabetic and stage renal failure. So if you go by the whole world, we are number five in terms of every year, how many new diabetic patients go for dialysis? Malaysia Bole, we are number five. And what more, if you go and you look at the numbers of how many new patients on dialysis each year in Malaysia, roughly around seven to 8,000 new dialysis patients each year, 66% are due to diabetes. So this, if you are a key, you are very, you know, very observant person, you will see just now that the Shalini shared, 44% of kidney failure is due to diabetes. That is the worldwide data. That's the world average. People can have kidney failure from other problems, from stones, from infection, from hypertension, but Malaysia, Malaysia champion, diabetes, very sweet. So Malaysia, 66% of the kidney failure patients are due to diabetes. This actually reflects on how poorly, how badly we are taking care of our diabetes because they don't take care of it well. We, we fail, I have to admit. Then we have more patients on dialysis. So we can have more diabetic patients, but we may not have more end stage if we take care of it well. We are not doing it well. And I'm going to tell you, judge and jury, put me to jail. Kidney is the main culprit because di diabetes can cause heart problem and you die. Well, short suffering, you die. Diabetes can cause kidney failure. You don't die. You suffer with dialysis for many more years ago. So I, I, I rest my case. I hope you get the point how important diabetes is and how dangerous it is in terms of causing kidney damage. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Dr. Yu. I don't think I want to be the judge uh, in this case because it, it, for me, I see every, nobody wins. Lah. This one, everybody also lose. Um, before I go to question, because I see quite a lot of questions are coming in already. Do you, do you, do you guys have anything to say? Uh, any more comments to add to what has been said by your colleagues? I open now uh, to not rebuttal. Lah. This is not, let's not, let's not fight for, for who is most most uh, fatal here can, can we or any comments to add based on what's been said by your colleagues anyone well, I'm, I'm in the spirit of rebuttal but then <laughs> I, would, I would like to just um, 
uh, I just remembered what a nephrologist used to ask uh, me and a group of friends who are in the hospital as we were discussing uh, the complication of diabetes. And the question was, which, if you were given the choice, which of these complications would you choose? Whether you're going to choose being blind or being uh, developing a heart attack or kidney failure. And being a nephrologist, she proudly say, if I were given the choice, I would choose kidney failure because there is always dialysis to sustain me. However, it will be so bad to be blind because of diabetes, because I can no longer enjoy anything else because I'm probably unable to see anything. So this is, uh, I mean, as uh, Dr. Yu was saying, it just come up to my mind that, you know, if I develop kidney disease, I hope that there will still be a machine to sustain me. But if I'm blind, I probably wouldn't get an eye replacement. Yeah. So she has, as a nephrologist, she chose uh, to have kidney failure. And obviously, she, she, the thing that she would not choose is being blind. A majority of them prefer uh, just dying of heart attack suddenly with no suffering. <laughs> Yeah, I Dr. guess Lee. same as what Dr. Gliss was sharing, you know, it's not a, really a competition to see who's worse. But <laughs> my point of sharing was just to share to the public, you know, how, how silently dangerous diabetes can be to, you know, everyone. Yeah. No, and also dialysis, sorry, yeah, just I've, mm. I've, I know some friends of mine who are on dialysis. Mm. For those of you who don't know what it is, right, it's, a, it's quite a lengthy process and it's quite mafan, mafan, it's what a troublesome, right? like to get yourself there and then you sit there for four hours or something like that. And I'm like, your day is gone. Correct, correct. It's actually not just about sitting there for four hours, three times a week, not just the time loss. Actually, dialysis until today is not a perfect modality for end-stage renal failure. No matter how good we try to give some kind of artificial medical treatment for patients with no more functioning kidneys, there are things we don't succeed. There are things that we don't remove well. There are things that we don't replace well. Um, until today, the best is still kidney transplant, where you know we put in a natural God or, or you know nature-provided organ. But until we have more transplants, end stage and on dialysis is like a norm, but it's actually not easy to live with. We have a lot of limitations. You can't eat this, you can't eat that, you can't drink too much, a lot of limitations. And patients yeah. really struggle. Do Dr. Lee, final, final thing to say here to when you want to jump in, what before because I'm going to start going to questions today. I got a lot. Lah. No, I just wish to state that there is a reason why all three of us are here um, at the same time. Um, in fact, there is um, an interlink between all three specialities. Um, the heart is often linked with um, the kidney in terms of diseases. Patients with kidney disease can end up having heart failure. And patients with heart failure can end up having kidney disease. And diabetes on its own may lead to kidney disease, may lead to the, to the complications of heart failure as well as coronary artery disease. So we, in fact, work fairly closely with one another. In fact, the treatment that is often given to patients would be meant to treat all three conditions at the mm -hmm. same time, as opposed to being one in isolation. So... We are all um, friends and we are not um, claiming territories here. Yeah. No, no, no. All, 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 all is bad. All. So my first, the first question here we have is could, could diabetes, this is predominantly for Dr. Shalini, but I'm sure all of you can jump in here. Could diabetes be reversed with proper care on food intake and routine exercise? The main thing is here, that means he's, because this person is concerned with food intake and routine exercise. Could these two things reverse diabetes? Thanks for the question. Um, I would be, uh, actually the reverse uh, in medical terms, we probably um, call remission, okay? Remission. Um, patients usually ask me, can I ever be cured of this disease? The answer is there's no cure for diabetes. The only thing is probably you go into remission where you will probably with intensive diet and exercise, you probably get a, a blood glucose level of near normal or normal uh, as someone without diabetes, or probably in the range of pre-diabetes, we call that partial remission with intensive diet and exercise, which often need to be accompanied with, with some amount of weight loss. Yeah. So if you're dieting and exercising, but there is uh, hardly any weight loss, probably you're not doing good enough. I'm talking for those uh, overweight and obese. If you're trying to reverse diabetes, 
um, or getting in, it into remission, you probably need to do uh, something uh, good enough that can be translated with some evidence of weight loss. Right, and we, the amount of weight loss that uh, we could quote is about in the range of seven to ten percent uh, to actually reverse diabetes. Yeah. Dr. Shalini, if I can uh, contribute, I remember seeing some papers where you know, with good diet control, with exercise, you may end up from initially diabetic and requiring medicine, and then you may end up with a, a period where you do not need medicine and you, you remain with good sugar control. But what would your advice be for patients who achieve that? Do you know, do, do they still need to do follow-ups? Do they still need this, to see doctors regularly? Or are they like cured and don't need to see doctors anymore? Thanks, Dr. Yu, for that question. Please, please do not lose touch with your doctors, yeah? Because as I've said, uh, it's a remission. So you never know uh, when the stress factors or the risk factors going to come again, you know, environmental factors, being stressed with life, being stressed with COVID will just uh, make uh, diabetes rare, its ugly head again. And then so all of a sudden, oh, I was normal three years ago and now your sh my sugar is now in the teens. We have many cases of that. So usually argues with me, hey, three years ago it was normal, you know, and now I'm full-blown diabetes. And what happened? I was just um, staying at home, being good, uh, um, uh, adhering to the standard operating procedures of not going out, and now I have diabetes. All right, so we have stories like that coming up. You know, as you stay at home, there are a lot of things that's happening in your home. You're eating more, you're exercising less, you're stressed more. Uh, a lot of these uh, uh, regulations are making people stress up. The income factor is not helping. So there are all these risk factors, I would like to say, that can really bring out the sugar and bring out the disease again. So please come back uh, to see the doctors as soon as possible if you have not seen one for a couple of years. Yeah. That, that's that's true la. doing the mco especially every time i'm staying at home one the one the purutu sun has come out my blood go upstairs man so uh we've got another question here could having natural foods such as fruits cause diabetes dr shalini oh okay <laughs> i i i i i really would encourage people to eat fruits la. Okay, um, but excessive amount of fruits, especially uh, uh, our local fruits, which are very sweet, uh, uh, I have seen it really, really shoot up the glucose level, especially uh, the durian season and the, 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 the red mangosteen and langsat season that is coming. I can see uh, I've had one, one uh, patient just argue with me. You know, I was doing very well just recently. And then after we dig, dig out the story, oh yeah, every day durian for the past few weeks. <laughs> All right. And then I add on another medication and then patients stop eating durian. Now the sugar is very good. And then uh, of course, yeah, the, the, the trick was just to stop eating so much fruits. Yeah. But please uh, do, if you were to ask to choose what type of fruits, I would say uh, any fruits that need, you need to chew would be better like guavas, apples, green apples, things like that. And fruits that are not extremely ripe would be good. And um, we usually uh, call these uh, high glycemic index fruits uh, such as watermelon, but you don't really need to chew at all. That would probably raise up your glucose level very high. Yeah. Okay. One more, most likely for Dr. Shalini also. Is it possible for a diabetic to be able to stop medication permanently? I'm going to guess the answer here, no. But now my Dr. Shalini, uh, you, you, you answer lah. Okay, permanently. All right, okay. Uh, there is only one uh, major intervention uh, that has actually helped patients to not need to take medication. And that is called um, extreme weight loss. Uh, either you do it through uh, metabolic surgery or bariatric surgery, where patient go, uh, people who are obese or overweight undergo surgery for weight reduction. Uh, those group of patients actually saw that they could literally take off their diabetic medications. All right. It's the one where they, cut the, where they, where they tie the stomach, is it this one? Uh, something like that, but tying the stomach is just uh, one type of it. The more uh, effective one is actually doing a surgery that bypass the stomach and a few others that, you know, cut your stomach to make it smaller so that you don't eat so much, right? So basically limiting your calorie intake by force, by surgery, by just making the stomach smaller. Okay. Dr. Lee, I got one question here. What are the symptoms 
of heart attack? I'm guessing pain. No? Yeah, that, that's a great question. In fact, um, the common or rather the classical symptoms of a heart attack, especially a major one, would really be chest pain and chest discomfort as the heart is located um, towards the left then the pain would actually be around the left side of the chest. And this may then move towards the arm, um, towards the jaw, and concomitantly patients would most of the time also have shortness of breath, um, nausea, excessive sweating, dizziness, and probably they might feel as if they are about to faint. But the caveat to all that I've said is that patients with diabetes, unfortunately, are notoriously known to not have the classical symptoms um, that I've just mentioned. And therefore, if a patient were to not have all of the symptoms um, that I've just said, but they were to have just very mild symptoms, maybe just one or two of the, the, the symptoms that I've mentioned, it is also worthwhile to seek medical attention um, if they just don't feel right. Because I got a story, right? My friend, I won't name names, uh, quite a famous fella. He was playing golf. But this is the story. He was playing golf. Then he felt chest pain. He felt a bit tired. So he rested in the buggy for about 10 minutes and then continued to finish the game. And then went home, took a nap, felt chest pain, went to see doctor. Apparently, he had suffered a heart attack. Is this even a plausible story? That is not, in fact, a plausible story. That is a very common story because a lot of these patients, and to put things into perspective, um, there was this one day when I was actually on call and I was called to the emergency because the, the electrocardiogram or rather the ECG had revealed that this particular patient had a massive heart attack, but he was extremely comfortable um, lying at the bed um, and he had very long-standing diabetes and all he had was just excessive sweating alone. So he actually came for a different reason um, as opposed to one that is very classical in terms of heart attack um, symptoms, but then he was found to have heart attack and thankfully the ECG saved his life and we were able to perform a coronary angioplasty um, in an urgent manner. Oh, yo. Okay, so I guess I got to believe him. Lah. Uh, uh, Dr. Yu, this one is especially for you. It says here, uh, Dr. Yu, so patient, I, yeah, this, I'm not sure I'm reading the question correctly. I'm going to try my best. Dr. Yu, so patient who has high cholesterol, blood sugar in HPT, even with well sugar control, the patient still may potentially develop AKI and CKD. Wow. So this, this, uh, this guy knows a lot of medical terms and the medical short forms. So I'm going to clarify the question. Okay, I hope please, I yeah. get the question correct also. So this patient probably says, this person probably says he has diabetes and probably he's talking about good sugar control. I think he's talking about HbA1c, which means the average sugar is good, but have high cholesterol. And he's asking, can this person, this sub, you know, um, you know made up person still develop AKI, meaning acute kidney injury, anything that harms the kidney suddenly? or CKD, CKD meaning chronic kidney disease, something that harms the kidney gradually. So to be honest, as I probably tried to mention just now, direct and indirect ways of causing kidney failure, you may have controlled the sugar, but you may not have controlled the blood pressure. You may not control other metabolic conditions and hence you can still have kidney damage. And if you remember the world data of diabetes causing end-stage kidney failure is only 44%. Okay, la, Malaysia menang 66 but do you have that 40% or more that is not due to diabetes? What I'm trying to say is, you may have diabetes, you may have good control, you may still get kidney failure from non-diabetic causes. So one of the, I feel personally, the Malaysian typical scenario will be actually traditional herbs, wrong medicines, nephrotoxic, they assume some herbs will save the diabetes and that end of the kidney will fail. I'm going to throw in a curveball. There was a question for Dr. Shalini that says, can a person be cured and forever no need treatment for diabetes? I'm going to give you a quick example. One patient three years ago, told to have diabetes, can't accept the fact, took traditional medicines and he checked his own sugars at home. Always very good. Traditional medicines works, man. So after three years, he came with leg swelling, shortness of breath, and we found out his kidney failed. So the, 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 the irony is when you kill the kidneys, your sugars improve. 
because kidneys actually filter out your naturally produced insulin. So when you have diabetes, your insulin secretion from your pancreas is insufficient. So your sugars are high. But you kill the kidney, then the kidney cannot filter out everything, including the insulin. Then you have a falsely normal insulin level. Then suddenly your sugar is good. So what I'm trying to say is the curveball. If someone wants to have no treatment for diabetes, sugar forever good, kill the kidney. <laughs> indirectly you know then you don't need medicine for diabetes because your sugar will suddenly become good not good not good so you, um i guess um back to the question the question was saying sugar good can the kidney still worsen the answer is yes unfortunately but sugar bad the kidney surely worsen even faster uh, that's like, the summary answer back to the question well done well done. And thank you for making sense of that question because I was like, oh, something, something, no, HPT, AKIC came completely knocked down. I was like, what is this fellow asking? <laughs> no, buy car, man. Okay, this next question. Uh, this, uh, what is it? Uh, what would you suggest, uh, this one is true for all three, what would you suggest to diabetes patients on how they can manage their diabetes since it's a progressive disease? That means, I think this one is like, you, are, you already know this disease is here, it's going to stay. How best for me to manage? I, 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 I expect that it's going to be here. I know I have it. How do I manage it? Because it's going to be progressive. Yeah. Well, this will have to Sorry, um, I should probably go first. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the whole diagnosis should actually be accepted well by the patient. And to begin with, I cannot um, further emphasize the importance of patient education. They have to understand what the disease is all about. They have to understand some of the potential complications um, as has been shown um, in the first um, slide. And they have to know that if the sugar control is poor, that one day they might end up having such complications. Of course, oftentimes, if these patients do not have much symptoms, they probably feel that there really isn't a need to be treated. Because a lot of these tablets that are taken would probably not be of any um, symptomatic benefit. They may not provide um, benefits in terms of reduction of symptoms, but this is something that you can only see in blood tests, for example. So I guess for a start, a good patient education, to improve their receptiveness um, towards some of the potential treatments that might be instituted to them in the future. And that would go a long way um, in helping them to cope with the disease. Dr. Shalini? Yeah, so for me, um, I, I would probably say that uh, if you're early on in the diagnosis, do your best to get your sugar at target as normal as possible. Knowing that it's a progressive disease, you want to delay or uh, probably uh, prolong the onset of the complications. And just to remind, the complications usually starts from the small vessels of uh, the body. And um, as mentioned, many of the symptoms are painless or symptomless, especially the kidney and the eyes. I, I always try to remind my patients, do you do need to have regular eye screening? Because uh, bef when the complications of the eye uh, cause a symptoms, it is usually too late, all right? And doctors can do probably too little, myself included, we probably can do very little to help reverse that. Uh, the rest, we just uh, pass it on to the ophthalmologist, the eye doctor, and um, often not whatever they do is just to preserve sight as much as they could all right so um even in the while i was in the government um working in the government clinics um, or even in the hospital uh, trying to remind my patients to get regular ice cream was really quite a tough thing to do because they simply couldn't see the rational or the uh, the goodness of getting ice cream because hey i can have uh, six six or twenty 2020 eyesight, why do I need to uh, get my ice cream? Even when it's free, it's already so difficult. If you have to pay for it, however more you probably will just keep it all together. All right, so please believe your doctors that these uh, uh, complications may set in. Uh, many of times without you realizing it has set in and at times it is too late. And um, what is more important, if your diagnosis of diabetes occur very early in life, that means in your 20s or even your teens, please uh, be more aggressive with taking care. What we are seeing is that uh, in younger type 2 diabetes, especially the complications seems to be more aggressive uh, and harder to treat uh, compared to uh, diabetes uh, occurring at the later age of life. Okay. 
And another thing to remember is that we have more and more younger uh, patients uh, going through dialysis in the early 30s and even 40s. Yeah? This is their peak, peak of time of their life where their career is bound and their children are supposed to be going to school and they have to take care of the kids and they are spending four hours, uh, four hours three times a week in the dialysis center is really very frustrating. Okay, and also the dialysis center cannot cope with the amount of patients and uh, we really need more and more dialysis centers and people like Dr. Yu are overwhelmed uh, with business. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put a very short answer. Thank you, Dr. Shalini. In fact, we are not happy to have so many. We see, we see so many cases and we feel sad. But anyway, for, for a take-home message for the diabetic patient who was talking about what should we do, simple. One is you have to come to terms. You have to you know, understand you have this disease, accept it, and look into how to take care of it. Very good that you have lifestyle, diet controls, and all that is, is important. But a very strong point is to have a good relationship and follow up with your regular doctors. There are things that you don't know unless you follow up and the doctors pick them up for you. For example, diabetic medicines can be norm. You can be having a lot of options right now, but as things progresses, we need to adjust. Something suitable for you today is not necessarily suitable for you five years later, three years later. And some Malaysians, some typical patients I see, they buy their medicines in the pharmacy, don't see a doctor, and then we treat myself. It's the same anyway. No, it's not the same. So come to terms, take care, and have your regular follow-up. Thank you very much. I, I got one here. Uh, it's, it's a personal question. Uh. Is this a Dr. Lee? My father is 65 years old now. He's taking... Walau, Diltiazem. Diltiazem, ah. I don't know. I hope you know this fella. Diltiazem, 60 milligrams three times a day. Peridopril, 8 milligrams daily and aspirin. Does my, is it possible that my father has fat in the heart? Yes. So for, for those um, that are watching now, um, both those pills, well, aspirin is actually a blood thinner. Um, Perindopril is um, a pressure tablet. And Diltiazem, presumably at this particular dose, um, is also um, to treat blood pressure. So if the question is whether there is a possibility of um, this particular patient having fat in the heart, i.e. atherosclerosis, the answer is very much so. In fact, if one were to do an individual risk scoring, this gentleman, by means of gender, um, Douglas males are automatically at a higher risk of having um, cardiovascular disease compared to females. Um, and this patient is 65 years of age and presumably because he is already on two um, high blood pressure tablets, the diabetes or rather the hypertension has probably um, been present for a substantial amount of time. So the possibility of having fat in the arteries is in fact very high. Okay. This question, I think is a trigger question. Now, I'm just, I'm, I probably won't even bother asking you this. It's just, it just sounds like a trigger question. If, if sweet fruits with high sucrose can contribute to diabetes, why can't monkeys get diabetes? <sighs> what about ants and other animals? Do you, do you want to bother answering this? I'm not, I'm not sure. Up to you. I'm going to go. Um, <laughs> how sure are you that monkeys don't have diabetes? How sure are you monkey don't have diabetes? <laughs> if you want to experiment, you put the monkey everyday sugar, I'm sure the monkey also get diabetes. But anyway, that's just a joke aside. We, should, we are probably not the professional vets to answer that question. But I guess um, you can't avoid the fact that nowadays diabetic patients live longer, stay alive more, and unfortunately, they get the complications. You go to like 100 years ago, there are no insulin. Patients with diabetes, the children are just dying. You know, then, then there's insulin, then there's medicine, and then people stay longer alive. But they also feel better, and hence they don't really, some may not feel like, hey, this is not a disease, it's made up. I don't feel so, you know, just the medicine, or doctor asked me to take medicine. So I guess I, I probably will have to answer that. Taking natural food doesn't cause diabetes. But if you are born with that risk, you are probably a familiar family of diabetes, you take natural food, so you will still have risk of getting diabetes, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I had a cat with diabetes and it needed insulin, like yeah. proper, like, yeah, it was yeah. like, and so yeah. no one went and bluffed the cat and tried and cheat. So no how can you say the monkey don't have diabetes? I'm not a vet, but I say monkey got. <laughs> okay, but, but this one you asked a very, I mean, you, 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 you brought on something I need to ask all three of you because this one, I am very interested, actually, I had a question. 
So actually, how much of this is genetic and how much of this is diet or lifestyle? Dr. Shalini. All right. So uh, very long time ago, uh, it's all about the genes. Uh. People will say, if my parents don't have diabetes, I would go free without diabetes. That is no longer true. You know why? Because we are Asians. Being Asians already put us at higher risk of being getting the disease. That's one thing. Uh, if you're Indian, the risk is even more higher. Second with Malay, the third is Chinese. All right. So this in terms of prevalence. Huh? Uh, another that's about genetics. So if your parents, one of them, uh, either your father have for type two diabetes, if your father has the disease, your chances is very high, about up to 60, 70 percent. All right. Both parents increase even more, about almost 80 percent chance of developing the disease. All right. That's about genetics. OK. But we are seeing more and more, you don't have to have any family members, not even in the extended family with diabetes and you have the disease and you come to me and say, how could it be possible? None of the family, the rest of them have diabetes except me. All right. The question is, environmental risk factors are always there. And stress, don't forget stress. If you are, do you know that um, sugar is addictive and one of the most effective stress reliever? Of course, it releases this hormone called serotonin that makes you feel happy. Okay. All right. So, and you know, the bubble or boba tea or whatever that's so popular in these days. Do you know how much, how many spoons of sugar there is in that? Um, you know, uh, one large bubble tea is about 20 spoons of sugar. And you know how much recommended uh, 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 tablespoon of sugar you're actually allowed in the day? Maximum eight. All right, so one bubble tea can already keep you alive for the next three days. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to reiterate that you know that there are a lot of factors out there that predispose somebody to diabetes. And long time ago, uh, carbonated drinks was one of the major risk factors. Uh, you drink carbonated drinks for one week, you're probably gonna get diabetes probably a few months down the road yeah now the reason i asked that question was because i think i attended one event because i had a cholesterol problem and so then they were talking about all these doctors were talking about you know diet and and what you can do and lifestyle and then one person one of them actually actually a lot of it is genetic for cholesterol is genetic so sorry lah <laughs> i'm like oh okay thanks huh? but i'm trying i'm trying I'm, I'm trying to you know be healthy um there is one question here which I would like to ask also because not only do we have uh, patients a lot of people who have diabetes here, we also have a lot of caregivers uh, in the audience today. So the question here is what are some practical tips that you can give to caregivers of patients with diabetes? All right. First and foremost, di di the diagnosis of diabetes is could be a very life changing uh, event. All right. You, um, I would say that the fact that once you're diagnosed with diabetes, most often that your whole lifestyle has to change, the food that you eat have to change, the food that you and the family eat have to uh, be probably more healthy, you know, the whole family have to go through the same process with, together with you. That's one of the things that probably the caregivers probably struggle to. Hey, I don't have the disease now, I can't have ice cream in the house, I can't have chocolates in the house, we can't have cakes regularly. So it can be quite depressing. But you know, there are a lot of food out there that is nutrient rich rather than calorie rich that are also equally tasty. So one of the things that the caregivers can go through is try to survey about all the good recipes that you can have uh, for uh, that are diabetic friendly. Another thing is that um, the fact that caregivers are usually bogged down by things like, you know, how much insulin should we inject for this patient, you know, the sugars this level. So one of the important things is that caregiver should try to reach out for a support, uh, whether from your care, um, your care providers that meet your doctors or diabetic educators, that they could really just pick up your phone and just call and ask, what do I do? So what is important is that uh, uh, establishment of a support group for the patient and of caregivers is also important. Uh, what to do in the event of hypoglycemia where the sugars goes down due to either medications or uh, uh, kidney failures, or organ failures that cause glucose to go down, what to do when that happens and what happens when the sugar is too high. So all these stressful events are very important. So I would uh, reiterate again the, the fact that Dr. Lee says education, 
is very important for so for me as a diabetologist or even an endocrinologist uh, we do a lot of education because you know we have probably the more time we don't have procedures so we probably talk a lot more uh, educating them is uh, probably one of the most important thing to do you know it, it probably people smile you know you talk a lot but a lot of things really makes a difference in the caregiver and the patient's life so indeed we really need to talk a lot yeah dr you dr lee yeah i think it's important to just look out for your loved ones right i think at any point in time we all have had family members of ours being unwell. And I think the anguish and the um, emotional trauma that comes along with those admissions are never fun. In fact, repeated hospital admissions are never fun either because it, in the long term, I guess it brings about um, a lot of disturbances to the overall logistics of the family. You've got to bring the patient in and you've got to bring the patient home. And it is going to be... Um, an extremely tough and emotional period um, if your family member is unwell. So don't only just look out for yourselves, look out for your loved ones as well. If you feel that they have not had a complete body check for some time, then bring them for it. And do not only just know your blood results, but please also look out for the blood results of your loved ones. Um, I, and I think Dr. Shalini and Dr. Lee has shared quite extensively on you know, what to look out for in diabetic patients. And just a, a quick shout out and you know, thanks to all the caregivers who are taking care also, you know, helping care for family members with diabetes. I would say it's, it's very patient, very demanding, and you also need to take care of yourself. You know? So make sure that you also take care of yourself, don't burn out. And uh, same goes to everyone with diabetes. It's, it's actually a chronic disease. Um, it's not easy. We all know as caregivers and healthcare, we all know it's not easy. Uh, we really want you to be well. Um, but I hope for that, some of us who, who, some of the patients who are early diabetic and you're feeling okay, please don't take it too mildly. It is uh, a silent disease. So please take care of it, especially in the early stages. You take care of it well, you, you will reap the benefit later rather than face the complications later. And for example, in diabetes patients, in kidney problems, the early stage of kidney disease due to diabetes is still reversible. I can still push back your kidney to normal function. But if you come to me at a very late stage, I can only prepare you for dialysis, which is sad, which is sad. So, uh, you know, for caregivers and patients aside, please take care, please take it seriously, but also be patient and be strong. Yeah, so I, I see this obviously here that like, if you catch it early, if you catch it early, the, mm. the message here is always if you catch it early. Mm. Just to remind everyone here, you can redeem a free diabetes screening at any participating clinic nationwide that is ongoing until the to, until December 2021. Visit www.foryoursweetheart.my www.foryoursweetheart.my to get your free diabetes screening voucher. A follow-up question to that for all of you uh, doctors here is at what age? Should we start doing sugar tests? How often should we do it? I believe that is for me. Okay, so at what age? I would say if um, you have most of the risk factor, you should come as early as puberty onset. Okay, so when you um, when you hit your you know for females probably when you have your menses and you're getting your your you're having the spike of your growth probably to do some screening especially if your mother while she uh, was carrying you in utero had diabetes in pregnancy uh, you should come earlier if your parents have and they have complications for from diabetes uh, whether it's kidney failure heart disease or even stroke come early, all right? We are seeing more younger onset type two diabetes uh, among Asian population, especially in Malaysia. So come as early as teenage. It's no longer a disease of the 40s or 50s. It's we are seeing as early as teenage uh, with type two diabetes. So uh, do consider a yearly screening or two or three yearly screening um, from then on if it's normal. I guess I, just to put in my simple opinion, when we were all learning, we always say, you know, 30 years old and above to, to watch out. But now we see more and more younger diabetes. So I guess people who are concerned, who have strong family history, who are, you know, risk factors such as being more fat and chubby, those kind of things, or you have symptoms, sometimes it's hard to tell, um, no harm getting it screened. You know, like you, you, Douglas has been sharing, you can get free diabetic checks. So what's the harm of doing a simple check? 
once a year if you are well. It's not 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 of any harm, and but I think of benefit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we are pretty much at the end of our session. Could I just get key takeaway? Uh, like. I wouldn't say one sentence. That is being very mean, are you? <laughs> but like, if you could, you know, you, you could distill everything into something that you could tell your audience that they could keep in their head and they could tell someone who needs to hear this. What would you tell? What would you say to them? Well, I first wish to take this opportunity to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I think your willingness to participate in an event like this is a direct reflection of your receptiveness um, towards medical education and the fact that you're willing to learn more, to embrace a healthy life um, in order for you to have um, better outcomes in the future. So I will leave you with just one mnemonic, which is do not forget your ABCs. A would be A1C and you need to check it regularly. B would be to always have a good blood pressure of which the definition it, it is that it should be less than 140 over 90 millimeters mercury. And C, you should always have good cholesterol levels. And finally, the S stands for smoking. So if you are at present moment in time smoking, please try to quit. And you have never started, then don't pick it up. I will go first, Dr. Shalini, and then you can wrap up. I'm going to use simple words. Manis, manis dahulu, susah, susah kemudian. So if you have diabetes, you don't take care, you manis, manis dahulu, later you have all the problems. I really hope all diabetes patients can really, you know, all the Malaysian diabetes can control better. Malaysia bully in the good way, not the bad way, not the number two in the world for end stage and diabetes. Please take care of it well because the earlier you control, the better the outcome. Take it seriously. Be strong, be patient, and remember, manis, manis, dahulu, susah, susah, kemudian. That's all. Okay. As for me, I just want to, to highlight the importance of um, uh, medication, okay? Because there are a lot of um, promotions out there that can, can so-called treat diabetes without medication, and many of times um, they fail. And please trust your doctors that none of our medications are going to destroy our kidneys or your liver, all right? All of them are probably going to prolong your life and many of them are probably um, uh, surviving because of these medications, including your cholesterol medications. I remember one cardiologist said, now, if can, they want to put the cholesterol medicine in the tap water, you know? Uh, so that, because that's probably one of the things that's going to help prevent the, the, the drainage, uh, the, the pump uh, or the plumbing system from getting clogged. All right, so please believe that the medication can help and it is a friend, not a foe, okay? And um, uh, I, I just had some type 2 diabetes patient, a 10 years history of diabetes. The moment I said, let's start medication, it's, it's, it's long due. Uh, he really, really was uh, said, no, no, I don't think I need it. It was good 10 years ago. It should be good now. I have been eating well uh, all through my, the 10 years. All right, unfortunately that didn't help. So at, at some point of time, please use the help that you can have. Medications are indeed a lifesaver. And uh, the last, um, I would, uh, for the sake of the heart, um, well, heart's day, uh, having a sweet heart is probably good for the heart. Having a sweet blood is bad for the heart. And of course, um, again, Happy World Heart Day to all the cardiologists and all the patients who have some form of heart disease. We marvel that the fact that you, you're living today is probably uh, the good works of the cardiologists or the good works of you doing something to preserve that. Uh, everything starts and ends with the heart. Okay, so the moment your mom sees the heartbeat and the ultrasound, that's the moment life begins. The moment the heart stops, that's when it all ends. So please protect your heart as your children and your loved ones need you to be around as long as possible and do not die a premature death. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very, very sobering uh, final <laughs> message, Dr. Shalini. 
Uh, thank you all to Dr. Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Yu, Dr. Shalini. Uh, I think uh, I will leave you in their good hands. Uh, they might be sticking around to answer some uh, extra questions. They like they like doing this. Doctors, uh, they like helping people, uh, which is good. Uh, thank you also to the Malaysian Endocrine and Metabolic Society, MEMS, uh, and Malaysian Diabetes Educator Society, MDES, also uh, Boringer Ingelheim, for organizing this. The star especially for organizing this. Thank you all for showing up. I am Douglas Dame. I, it's, it has been very sobering. I, this, I've never been <laughs> this serious before in any event, uh, but I know that this speaks to a lot of people and a lot of people are suffering. A lot of people are concerned. A lot of people are looking at this and some are lost and have no idea what to do. These sessions, I hope, will give you some clarity, um, give you some hope. Uh, but yeah, do get screened as early as possible. You can get free screenings. And the star, uh, your turn now, now. Thank you very much, Douglas. Thank you to our three expert panelists, Dr. Lee, Dr. Shalini, and uh, Dr. Yu. And not forgetting Douglas for moderating this uh, enjoyable session. Uh, it, indeed, it was actually a very fruitful session. I think we've covered a lot of grounds and the audience would have learned a lot from each panelist and probably got some very valuable takeaways, especially those who are actually suffering with diabetes or actually taking care of somebody who's diagnosed with diabetes. I'm sure that the audience has a better understanding on the different types of diabetes related complications and urgency of early detection. Uh, before we end, please do help us complete the evaluation poll, which will appear on your screen now. And once again, thank you everyone for joining us today. And a big thank you to Boringer Ingelheim for supporting and making this webinar possible. And for those who would like to rewatch tonight's session, please go to our Starbiz Facebook page. Good night, everyone, and take care.